Hi, welcome back to the MyGo YouTube channel. This video we're looking a little bit deeper into UV for indoor growing. Previously we looked at whether uh, it was worthwhile adding UV to your grow room in terms of what studies were out there. And today we're going to look at what is the best spectrum source for uh, UV. So we are going to analyze and compare spectrum from things like HID, black lights, uh, but also ceramic metal halide, uh, metal halide, all that stuff. We've got uh, compact fluorescent UV sources and the sort of more traditional um, fluorescent tubes. This one is a reptile tube. We're going to look at all these ones plus some published spectrum from um, specialist UV for growing sources and we're going to compare them and analyze them and assess what ones are suitable and hopefully what ones are best for your grow. So I've taken the spectrum information from widely available grow light sources with uh, potential for UV, for UV A and B and I plotted them on the graphs here so that we com can compare them against each other. I don't have a sensor that current or a spectral radiometer I should say that currently reads below 380 nanometers uh, or down into the deep UVA or UVB so I'm using the spectrum graphs from the suppliers documentation be it on the label or packaging or on their websites or whatever and I've just tried to normalize them or put them in the same scale so that we can compare them against each other but they're not a hundred percent accurate they're really for reference and comparison uh, for the purpose of this video only. What we're trying to identify from the spectrographs is what is the uh, content or proportion of content of the light source that is UVA or B. You can see this visually. And then of that UVA content is there a significant amount of UVB, which is the one we desire to uh, add to our grow light spectrum in order to stimulate um, increases in potency and that type of thing. So it's UVB we're, we're mainly looking for, but we will of course analyze for, for uh, UVA also. So the spectrum graphs, uh, as you can see here, um, our normal UV light spectrum here, we're, we're running, normally we look at the power range, uh, so we look from 400 to 700, this is the same as the visual range, uh, from blue to red. And we measure grow lights in terms of, of what's available in that spectrum range. For this purpose of this analysis, we are also looking at the uh, UVB and UVA. Uh, not the far red on the right hand side, although you will see um, that reflected in the spectrum graphs. And UVB generally runs from 280 to 320 nanometers. Uh, below 280 is UVC. Again, that's dangerous and unwanted. Damage cells, cause cancer, all that stuff. Um, and uh, UVA runs then from 320 up to 400 nanometers. Looking at the sunlight spectrum, of course, for reference. And you can see there about 3% of sunlight is UV radiation and of that 3% it's about 30 to 1 UVA to UVB. Pretty much no UVC in sunlight spectrum, it's screened out by ozone and oxygen in the um, upper atmosphere. Next very important reference is uh, mercury. And that's because many, grow many lighting sources are actually powered in a sense by mercury vapor. So there's mercury vapor in HID lamps and in fluorescent tubes, which when um, electricity or energy is flown through it, uh, will output a spectrum. This spectrum is often used with phosphorescence inside the tubes or other elements in the tubes to generate a broader band spectrum or to enhance certain parts of the spectrum. But this is the raw mercury spectrum. It starts off emitting photons uh, down on the left here, right down in the UVC territory. And then you can see these uh, emission uh, sort of spikes based on the characteristics of the mercury. 
Of course, in, uh, in lighting fixtures, you've got glass in front, and this glass is going to block UVC in quite a proportion of UVB as well, just as, a, as a, with any glass at all. And uh, it quite often will block right up into the UVB and UVA territory, as we'll see further down. I'm going to keep that mercury spectrum uh, underneath um, for the purpose of just keeping it as reference while we're looking at the other spectrum of the other uh, uh, light sources. The first one is HPS and in HPS we can see that there is a small amount of UVA but uh, it, it um, does not extend down into UVB. So it has some UVA, but not, not UVB, is what, which is what we're searching for. Metal halide, similar. It's got about a half the, the broadband of um, UVA, or the bandwidth of UVA in terms of spectrum, but no UVB. Uh, CMH, a little bit deeper reach into the UVA spectrum, but, but again, uh, no UVB. So HID sources. Uh, are useful uh, for UVA but not UVB. White LED um, has pretty much zero UVA and that's common across the board whether it's COBS or quantum boards or any of these. Uh, this is the micro um, spectrum as it happens, 3.5k colour spectrum. There are some manufacturers which add UVA LEDs uh, at quite an expense. They are expensive to add um, compared to other um, light sources like white LEDs or red LEDs or blue LEDs or whatever. They're much more expensive cost-wise. And UVB LEDs exist. I've tested them. They don't work. Uh, you don't get, get anything out of them uh, of note. Uh, it's pretty much impossible to supply UVB through LEDs. The next spectrum I looked at is a regularly used source of UV and sold as such. It's the iHortLux PowerVeg fluorescent. You can see that the spectrum follows very much the mercury spikes and it has quite a lot of uh, high proportion of UV A and B in comparison to its visible spectrum. Its visible spectrum is obtained by the phosphorus lining of the um, fluorescent tube. So the mercury uh, emits photons itself and then those photons interact with the phosphorescence on the tube lining and create um, photons of other spectrum, other wavelengths. Um, so in this case this is a, a, a good source of uh, UVA and uh, UVB. Next one is the Agromax Pure Veg. You can see with this one that it has uh, a much higher proportion of blue in the spectrum, not much green or yellow, but uh, again a good source of UVA and B. The Agromax Pure UV is a very impressive looking spectrum where the absolute bulk of the UVA, sorry, the bulk of the output of the um, fluorescent is UVB and UVA and very little dedicated to um, the visual spectrum so this is an excellent source of UV in a, according to its, um, its spectrograph on the website. Uh, Solicure Flower Power it shows your typical uh, the spectrum you get from the website shows the typical emission spectrum in the UVA and B but they don't have the visual aspect uh, present on their spectrum charts on their website so I can't really assess them. They would seem to be dedicated to the UVA and UVB and therefore uh, uh, definitely a good source. On to some of the more widely available particularly in Europe um, the UVA and B uh, reptile bulbs. These are the Exoterra ones. This is the five which has a lot in the visible spectrum but it does contain UVA and B. The 10.0 which is much more in the visual spectrum and less in the UVA and B. But the Exoterra 200 
is has quite a high proportion of UV A and B output. So it's, it's quite a useful substitute for those who can't get those, um, you know, the eye hortolux or the solar cures. Uh, Exoterra UVB CFL does contain, as you can see here, uh, UVB and UVA, as well as spikes in the visual spectrum, and that is high a percentage output of uh, UVA and B. Having looked at the grow light spectrum output and analysed it, uh, we can see that the fluorescence have UVA and UVB content. However, uh, from a HID and UV point of view, really we're only getting, sorry, an LE, HID and LED point of view, we're really only usefully getting UVA. And all the studies tell us that we really need UVB and UVA, uh, but in particular UVB. So we're going to focus on these as being the most effective sources to fluorescence. Uh, I have, of course, tested these guys, so put them all into a reflector and test them with the same sensor, it's the Apogee SU100, and this is a UV A and B sensor. And what I've tested is for the output of each of these UV sources in watts per watt. So how many watts UV do they output per watt consumed using a high quality reflector, reflective space and um, you know, power supply. So uh, these are all the ones I tested. Some of them are from the grow shop, uh, some from the reptile shop, um, all the ones that I could get locally here. Um, so the uh, solar lamps and incandescents are, are pretty much useless. Don't put out any UVA or B. Uh, the CFLs and reptile fluorescence, I'm measuring sort of three to five percent. Uh, take three percent maybe as a, as a rule of thumb with those. Uh, the reptile UV fluorescent was a high UVB one, similar to Solar Cure and um, HTG UV and stuff. Uh, UVB LEDs useless, couldn't couldn't actually sense any output from it. The UV LED was very high in terms of efficiency, um, but it's as I said, it's very costly and it's only outputting uh, a high frequency UVA, which is not particularly useful for us. This 400 watt UV HID, if you want just UVA, it's a great source and cheap too. That's the Sylvania, available on um, Amazon. And then ceramic metal hide and metal halide and HPS, you're getting this uh, free basically with your, um, with your normal grow light, so it's, it's, it's in addition to, uh, but uh, it's just UVA and there's not a huge proportion of it is being output in UV. So the cost, well in terms of, uh, for me here, in terms of what I purchased in euros per watt, uh, it's relatively high of course for these HID sources, but you're getting it free with them, so um, you know the, the calculation doesn't make a huge amount of sense there. Uh, the Sylvania UV HID, if you want UVA, is very good value for money. UV LEDs, although expensive, they are efficient, so they're, they're reasonably low cost. But I found the CFLs and reptile UV fluorescence as being very effective. Uh, the fluorescence are a little bit tricky because you have to get your, your um, fluorescent transformer and everything else with it and all that kit, and that's quite expensive, and the tubes are quite expensive. These little 20 watt CFLs, uh, QTX do them on Amazon. Very cheap, plug them straight in, simple fixture, so uh, cheap cost. So in summary, what are the best sources? Well, HID and LED, they're only UVA, they're relatively low percentage output. Uh, so really we're down to looking at fluorescence for UVA and B. I'm estimating about 3% of the output in terms of watts per watt, 3%. Uh, UV watts per watt uh, consumed. About four to one is the mixture of UVA and UVB. So again, you can you can calculate yourself how much UVB you're um, going to be transmitting roughly. So lastly, we know that fluorescents are the best sources of UVA and B. They have a relatively high proportion of UVB, which is very useful for us. Um, they're also relatively low cost. Uh, and high efficiency and uh, 
but we need to know how much to apply and for how long. I've looked at the various recommendations from the different manufacturers. So uh, Solicure, California Lightworks, HTG, Solicure says 28 watts per square meter, California Lightworks is about 18 watts, HTG I couldn't find it. The 1986 experiment we referenced in the previous video where they, um, they demonstrated this improvement in potency, they had um, 90 watts of uh, fluorescent UV per square meter. I've just done a calculation on sunlight, uh, proportionate, so uh, at midday we're about 2000 micromoles uh, and we get about 60 watts per meter squared of UVA and UVB. Matching sunlight percentage for 600 ppft is about a third of that, so one third of 60 watts is 20 watts UVA and B. Now the proportion of UVB in sunlight, we're targeting UVB here, Proportion of UVB in sunlight is about 20 to 1, uh, whereas fluorescent uh, is about 5 to 1 or 4 times more UVB uh, to UVA. So in terms of fluorescence we need about uh, a quarter of that 20 watts or 4 watts of UVB per square meter. And at 3% uh, efficiency of our fluorescence that's about 120 watts of fluorescent. So, uh, yeah, the MIGO recommendation for high UV fluorescent tubes is 90 watts. It's really going back to this 1986 experiment uh, for six hours a day uh, during the flowering period. And, um, you know, in theory, from the, those experimental results, you should get 10 to 15% increase in THC at around that level. So, um, yeah, that's as much as information as I have on the UV. I'm looking forward to your feedback and comments and suggestions. And uh, yeah, hopefully some of you guys out there are going to do some experimentation on this, do some testing, and uh, we might get some objective results. So, thanks for, for watching. Take care. Bye.